Imagine that I am an expert financial economist who has predicted every single up and down, upswing and downswing of the New York Stock Exchange. Open a bracket here. This is a fictional person, yeah. like a unicorn. No economist has ever predicted any economic phenomenon ever. Ever. The 2008 crisis, I predicted it. Yeah? But you know why? Because I'm a left-winger who constantly foresees the collapse of capitalism. <laughs>
really exist in capitalism because the economic... And that, that, of course, begs a lot of questions. I, yeah, know, yeah. I know that. But so allow me to answer them as succinctly as I can. Look, take the difference between a real scientist, a physicist or a meteorologist, and an economist. Ostensibly, the two disciplines look very, very similar. If you open you know, a standard textbook on thermodynamics or meteorology, uh, you will find uh, mathematical models based on certain assumptions. They move on to theorems. Then they prove the theorems. Then they have lemmas. And then beyond that, what they do is they produce from those theorems and the equations of the theorems, they produce predictions about the weather. Then those mathematical models and predictions go inside the computer. The computer is connected to data uh, gathering instruments like you know, satellites and thermometers and barometers and so on. So data is fed into this computer. And then there is a statistical technique for testing whether the, predict the, the prediction that came out of the mathematical theory um, is confirmed or disconfirmed by the data. So that's, that's the meteorologist's little game. What about the economists? Similar. You have mathematical models of the economy that are identical in terms of the actual mathematics to the ones that physicists use. The reason is because the economists copied them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah? It's called physics envy. <laughs> and we suffer from that in economics. Yeah? Uh, uh, so there are the mathematical models of the economy, there are assumptions, there yeah. are proofs, there are theorems. And then those theorems and mathematics go inside computers that are then connected again to data gathering uh, instruments, like for instance, you know, the Bloomberg screen yeah. that all finances look at with data on bond prices, yields on prices, on, on, on commodity prices, on interest rates. Huh? And there is what is called econometrics, which is a statistical method of testing to see if the theory fits the facts or not. So th those two look like exactly, yeah. So economists have convinced themselves that they are the scientists of society and that there is no difference really uh, they think that their job is slightly more difficult because we have to do with human beings who are uh, more um, um, unpredictable mm -hmm. and facile and have tendencies towards irrationality. But on the other hand, nature also has, in Butter biology, flies. mutations. <laughs> you have, you have uh, random events, um, yeah. radiation coming suddenly from a comet. It's not true. The two are chalk and cheese, even though they look exactly the same. And let me tell you what the difference is and why I'm saying there are no experts. Yeah. The difference is that nature doesn't give a damn about our theories about it. <laughs> so if a meteorologist, suppose I'm the best meteorologist in the world, huh? and I've predicted every twist and turn of the weather and so on, and tonight, with some of you, we go out for dinner, and I have a few too many beers, or whiskeys or whatever, and as I come home, Something gets into me, probably too little blood in my alcohol, and I tweet that tomorrow <laughs> there is going to be a major storm in Toronto, and there will be a twister going through the public library, the reference library of Toronto. Yeah? Now, is this going to change the probability of there being a twister through Toronto tomorrow? No. The, you know, nature doesn't give a damn about what I'm saying about it. So, you see, this is the beauty in, th in natural sciences. Nature is an objective judge of our theories. And in the laboratory, you can have a system where you can con con continually discard the lesser theories, and you have an evolutionary process, scientific process, that selects for the theories that make more sense and which predict nature better, because nature doesn't give a damn about them. But, just for a moment now, imagine that I am an expert financial economist who has predicted every single up and down, upswing and downswing of the New York Stock Exchange. Open a bracket here. This is a fictional person, <laughs> yeah. like a unicorn. No economist has ever predicted any economic phenomenon ever. <laughs> ever. The 2008 crisis, I predicted it. Yeah? But you know why? Because I'm a left-winger who constantly foresees the collapse of capitalism. <laughs> so I predicted it, I did predict it, like a stopped clock tells that 
the time correctly twice a day. Yeah. Not because I am a scientist. Okay, <laughs> close the parenthesis. Yeah. Okay? But now, imagine that I am indeed somebody who has you know, science fiction. Imagine that I have predicted all the crashes and all the upswings and all the fluctuations in the NASDAQ, um, the FTSE, and so on. Hmm? And I go out with some of you tonight, and I have a few beers, and completely as a prank, I tweet that tomorrow the stock exchange will crash. Do you know what's going to happen? It will crash. <laughs> Why? Because people believe me. Because I have a reputation, even if, you know, even if I'm a complete fool okay, I do, or drunk. I want to press you on that. But because you see, the, the, so the point is there yeah. are no experts. And no. therefore, I'm closing my yeah. answer to you by saying, if there are no experts in economics, and the economy penetrates every dimension of our lives, is it not true to say that the only way democracy can survive is if each one of you learns how to speak authoritatively about the economy and about the things that determine your lives as part of your active citizenship. And that's why I wrote this book. Okay, that's very important. So I want to talk about the fact that you, instead of mathematical models, you use stories to tell that, that story of uh, the birth of capitalism to your daughter. But before I go to that question, yep. I do have this burning question. Please. Um, and it's, and it's uh, related to what just, you just relayed to us. In your book, you talk a lot about how um, you, know, you can't predict. There's this people, if, if, the, if the market is optimistic, then people will behave perhaps in ways that um, uh, you can quasi-predict, and if the market is not optimistic, then people will behave in another way. Um, so you talk a lot about this notion of um, will people behave in a self-destructive manner and go against what they are hearing about the market, or will they actually um, behave in a way that would uh, prove that um, they understand what's going on in terms of you know the products that they're trying to sell or the products that the, or the or the labor that they're trying to um, uh, lower in terms of wages. Um, you describe that in terms in many different ways throughout the book. But how do you know that people actually behave in those ways? That's what I don't. That's what I didn't get when I was reading this book because you talked a lot about how market optimism affects you know. Um, uh, uh, in a, in a in counterintuitively how people behaved. The beauty of uh, st statistics is that it can actually inform you about these things. It cannot confirm or disconfirm your theories, but take the following fact. Yeah. Since 2008, in the global economy, we've had the largest saving rate in the history of humanity. We have saved, as a, as a species, a human, humanity, you know, China, America, Europe, uh, India, we have saved, on average, 38% of global income. This is the highest rate of savings in the history of humanity. And at the same time, we know that the rate of investment into things that humanity needs, not, I'm not talking about speculation, you know, investing in pieces of paper and shares and derivatives, but actually, you know, things like schools, hospitals, uh, roads, uh, railways, aeroplanes, uh, machines, robots. Eh? Our investment rate is the lowest as a percentage of total income than it has been since 1950. So that answers your question. Yeah. We have savings up to there, a mountain of savings, and investment there. Now, that tells you that there's something the matter here. Why aren't the savers, the people who actually have the money, and it's usually corporations, you know, Apple has 260 billion saved. Yeah? Billion. 260 billion saved. Why? Why does a corporation need to save money? It's households that should be saving money. So, why aren't the owners of this mountain of savings investing it? And the only genuine explanation, the only sensible, the only thing that makes sense, it's not that they don't want to save. Mm -hmm. Sorry, they don't want to invest, because if you have money and it's sitting there doing nothing, it's, it, 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 that's a curse. Huh? Because it's not, it's, it, it, it is not multiplying for you, yeah. and it's not doing good things. So there's no investor who doesn't want to save. The reason why they don't save is they're scared. And what are they scared of? 
imagine you are a, an, an entrepreneur, an industrialist, and you are trying to, you, you're trying to work out whether you should create a new production line, a new product line, a new factory, to buy a new you know, um, uh, set of aircraft if you, are, if you are running an airline. What stops you from doing it? The fear that if you do this, make this investment, then there will not be enough demand, there will not be enough customers who want what you are producing and have the money to pay for it. Because if you make the investment and then there is not enough demand, you lost the money. So if you thought that there was going to be the demand, hmm, then you would invest. And then if you're a smart person, you think, okay, so what does it depend on? Whether they are going to, ha to, to have the money and the interest in purchasing my stuff. Well, it depends on the level of economic activity generally. So it depends on whether other people like me invest. Because if other people like me, investors, who have cash sitting there idly, if we all invest, or a significant percentage of us, of us invest, jobs will be created, huh? incomes will be produced, and there will be demand for what I am going to be producing. So it's like a situation where you will invest if you think that others will invest. But then each one of the others are in the same situation. They will invest if they think that you are investing. So you will invest if you think that they think that you think that they think that you think that they think <laughs> that we are all going to invest. Yeah. Okay? Now, notice the indeterminacy here, the impossibility, of the impossibility of predicting what will happen. And I will illustrate this by uh, considering two possible situations. One is that we are optimistic. So I am optimistic that you are optimistic that I am optimistic and therefore that I will um, invest and you will invest. And then what we do is invest. And then demand is high, and then our investments pay uh, good returns, and then we say, see, we were right, smugly. <laughs> Case number one. Case number two, I'm pessimistic, and you're pessimistic. I fear that you're not going to invest, and therefore I decide that it's not right for me to invest because there won't be enough demand. I don't invest, you don't invest, there is not enough demand, you see, you see I was right. <laughs> so you have two possibilities here. One is a, a capitalist economy that's doing well, and one that's doing badly. And all that it depends on is a, an equilibrium of belief, faith, nothing yeah. else. Yeah. Okay? Now, when you have the economy that we've been having since 2008, after that great crash in 2008, and investors see that the only reason why the United States economy has been refloated is that the Federal Reserve has been printing money, giving it to people like me, the investor, giving it to the rich people, it's not giving it to the poor people, it's giving it to the bankers, and the bankers are giving it to Apple. They're not giving it to those who can't repay their mortgage, who had their house repossessed, who can't find a job, who, who have to, use, to be Uberized in their existence, you know, to work 20 hours a day uh, without social security, without health cover, and so on. They don't get a penny. So in, the, the rich people, of course, like it to, to be the ones that... But at, then they get very concerned, because in the middle of the night, they hear that the Federal Reserve, or your central bank here, is printing even more money to give to me. Should I rejoice? No. Because my concern is where is the demand going to come for the things that my company is going to produce? The news that the central bank is printing more money and the interest rates goes down is good news because it means that you have more money and also you pay less in order to borrow to invest. But then it's extremely bad news because you hear, you hear this in the middle of the night when you're tossing and turning, wondering whether you should invest, and you think, oh my God, for the central bank to be reducing interest rates again below zero, or to be printing more money, things must be bad. I'm not going to invest. So you see, unlike a farmer's market, where you know, if, you have, if there is a seller of potatoes, if you're a potato producer, you take your potatoes to a farmer's market, and you know, by one o'clock at noon, you have not sold. You have not sold out. You still have potatoes. All you need to do is reduce the price of the potatoes, and by two o'clock they will have gone. So price comes down, excess supply, excess produce, is eliminated, it's purchased. The same thing doesn't happen with two things, labor and money. Because if you, employers hear that all wages are coming down, or stagnating, they like the idea they will be paying less, but that doesn't mean they will hire more workers, because they think, ah, oh, yeah, but who's going to buy the stuff? Because you know, all workers are getting less money, demand is going to fall, even though my labor costs are coming down, that is not a reason to employ more people. So you have a situation where the price of labor is coming down, and the quantity of labor 
purchased, employed, comes down. And that is you know, a case of recession, of a stagnating labor market. It is what we've been experiencing in the West since uh, 2008. And the market mechanism cannot recover from that. So I, n I don't want to be um, misunderstood. It's not that we can't understand capitalism. It's not that we cannot um, even discern the pattern that is unfolding in front of our eyes. What I'm saying is that we cannot do this on the basis of mathematical, pseudo-scientific models where the truth about capitalism resides inside the equations. Great, which actually leads us back to, you know, the storytelling inherent in the book and how you sort of tell these stories. And in fact, the story you just told um, sort of started with the 18th century enclosures in a way, because that's how this whole problematic that you just described to us began. Maybe it's a good idea for these guys to know a little bit about um, why that was. It was certainly the first time I've ever heard of sheep as being the cause for the problems we have today. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the wonderful things that we have today. Yes. You see, this is the, the thing about capitalism. It is producing magnificent um, technologies. It liberates us, has liberated us from feudal bonds, from the superstition of the church, from the authoritarianism of the king. Yeah? And at the same time, created new forms of slavery for us. So it's a contradictory story. It's not, it's not, I'm, I'm not trying to, to tell a, you know, a black and white kind of yeah. story. Yeah. Um, so no, look, the, the, the point about the enclosures is this, that I was trying to think of how, how do I explain to my daughter, who, by the way, is my worst critic ever, <laughs> and if I use the word capitalism, she will just shut me out because to, to her it's jargon and she's completely right. Uh, but how do I explain capitalism to her without using a standard, boring definition that means nothing in the end to a young person? Uh, and the, 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 the major point I wanted to, to make is that the kind of market society, cap, call it the market, I, I prefer to call it market society because as a leftist, leftist, I've had enough of hearing the word capital and capitalism. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's nauseating after a while. <laughs> uh, so market society, a society that does most things through markets. How did they, I wanted to, to, to convey to her this strong sense that it is a mistake to think that we always had it. We always had markets. The Phoenicians were traders. The Egyptians traded with the Cretans and the Cretans with the Athenians. And I'm sure that uh, you know, the, the good people of Central America were also trading um, at more or less at the same time as, as were the Chinese and the Africans and so on. But those societies were not market societies. Most of the activity in those societies had nothing to do with the market. The market was peripheral. It was marginal. So take, for instance, feudalism. Take Europe in the 17th and, and, and early 18th centuries. Land was not a commodity. It was valuable, but you could never buy it or sell it. Either you inherited it because you were the lord of the land and you got it from your dad. Uh, and then, you, of course, it, it, you would never imagine selling it. Selling your land, of the land of your ancestors, was uh, sinful. It was l frowned upon. Uh, it just was never done. The only way of acquiring new land was through conquest, through raising an army amongst your peasants and uh, occupying or grabbing, expropriating somebody else's land. And if you were a peasant, you never had land. You belonged to the land. You had your house, your hat. You grew cauliflower or whatever you, you grew on it, but you, you never owned land and you could never imagine. There were no classified pages in newspapers saying, you know, three acres of land for sale or for rent. There was, no, there was no land, land as a commodity. Labor was not a commodity. There was a lot of work, but nobody actually sold their labor as such. They produced work, they produced work. They harvested the land, they cultivated and harvested the land, and then the sheriff would come to you at the end of the harvest cycle, representing the Lord, and take a cut for the Lord. So you had production first, no labor market. Then you would have distribution between the peasants who produced and the landlords that sponged off them. Then the landlords would take their cut, and because they, they couldn't eat all this wheat or corn, whatever it was, they would sell it in nearby markets. So there were markets, but they were marginal. They had nothing to do with production. Okay? Uh, and th they would get some money for it. 
and therefore they would be the moneyed ones, and they would lend to others. So finance came last. So you had this very simple procession, production, distribution, finance. And then something remarkable happened, which ushered in market societies, capitalism, the world as we now know it and take it for granted, uh, we, uh, making the, mis the mistake of assuming that it was always like this. It wasn't. And what was that event? The eviction of the peasants from the lands of England, Scotland, and Wales. Why were they evicted? And when I say evicted, I'm talking about large-scale evictions. 70% of the population was evicted. Can you imagine that? That's, you know, something like a civil war. It's, it's a major calamity for 70% of the, of the population. To, and they were forcefully evicted, violently, brutally evicted. And most of them died of starvation, of disease. Uh, the ones who didn't die turned the nearby villages into slums, which then became the great cities. Manchester, Birmingham, London, uh, Liverpool, Glasgow, and so on. Now, but the question is, why were they evicted? Now, technology explains it to, to some extent, actually to a large extent, because what happened was the uh, techniques of shipping, shipbuilding and navigation improved sufficiently for uh, English traders uh, and ship owners to be able to circumnavigate uh, the planet. So they would take the only thing that, what was the only thing that Britain produced at the time, which could last a long journey and had some value to people in India or in Japan? Wool. wool. Because wool, yeah, you can store it in a wet wooden ship and, you know, it still maintains its properties, whereas uh, cauliflower does not. <laughs> it's useless. It rots within a day. Um, so they, they, they would carry large quantities of wool, relatively large ones, go to India if they survived, mm -hmm. uh, because half of them drowned on the way, sunk. Uh, and in India, where there was no wool, they would swap the wool for silk and spices, things that did not exist in Europe. Then some of them even went further away to Japan and swapped some of the spices and, and the silk for Japanese swords and artifacts of great um, um, technique in, 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 in their production. Because, as you know, the Japanese are fantastic at uh, creating artifacts. And then they would bring that ship back to Southampton in England, and their cargo would be worth a thousand times the quantity of wool that they started with. So these dirty, pirate-like merchants <laughs> suddenly acquired huge power, money. And for the first time in human history, you had this dissection of the realm of power. Before this, power was one thing. You were the lord, you had military power. Because you had military power, you had the power over the peasants. If they complained, you slaughtered them. You took a large part of their harvest. That gave you financial power. So it was all one. Political power, military power, economic power, discursive power, even religious power, because you controlled the priest and the bishop. And if the bishop disagreed with you, you separated his head from his shoulders. <laughs> and you had, a, you know, you, 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 you even, in, in on occasions, you, you consider yourself to be the, the new cardinal, right? But with this international trade system, suddenly you have low lives in the eyes of the establishment, merchants, who would never be allowed into their court. They would never be allowed in the Martin Manor House. They considered to be dirty little merchants. But suddenly these dirty little merchants had a lot more money than they did. So you have the separation of the political sphere from the economic sphere. Yeah? And some of the lords, in Britain in particular, uh, were smart enough to say, well, if you can't beat them, join them. So they started thinking, well, what is the point? They would look outside their, their castle window, and they would look at the rolling hills of Wales, of England, <laughs> with all these peasants growing cauliflower. Think, what's the point? Get rid of them and replace them with white, fat sheep. Because their wool now has an international price and it can make me rich. With the help of the king's army, 70% of the peasants were thrown off the land and replaced by sheep. And look at what effect that had in bringing 
ushering in today's market society. The moment you throw the peasants out of the land and you enclose them with barbed wire, that's the enclosures, because before that there were no enclosures, there were no fences, there was no need for fences before that, uh, and you put sheep in there, suddenly land becomes commodified. It acquires a price. Before that it had no price. It had value, symbolic value, it was the land of my ancestors and I am the lord of the land, but it had no price because there was no market for it. If you don't buy and sell something, if this is never bought and sold, it doesn't have a price. Same thing with the acres of land. But suddenly, when you knew that every acre of, of land huh, could raise 20 sheep, 50, I don't know, I have no idea, X sheep, huh, you know how much wool each one of them produces, you multiply by the number of sheep that you can have in one acre of land, and you know how much money each acre of land gives you. So suddenly that acre of land has a price. This is associated with international trade and wool. Of course, lords didn't want to be entrepreneurs. The last thing, you know, they, they considered their divine right to laziness, to be uh, unassailable. But what they thought very cleverly was, well, not, not that cleverly, it was quite obvious, take one of those peasants that they had thrown out and say, you're going to be an entrepreneur now. They didn't use that word. But come here, I will lease these acres of land to you, and you pay me rent for that. The poor ex peasant would say, but I have no money. I don't worry, I'll lend you the money. Yeah? So look at what happens. First comes finance. The loan comes at the beginning. I will lend you money to rent my land from me. And you take the sheep in and, and you know, you, you shear them and you get the wool and you sell it. And after you pay wages to, other, to the shearers and so on, wages were subsistence wages, you know, a loaf of bread, which was more than enough for the other ex-peasants, you know, to, to, to survive. And you will be the residual claimant, the person who, in the end, what is left over after the sale of the wool, you keep the rest, that's your profit. And those poor ex-peasants were forced to be entrepreneurs, to be capitalists. They didn't want to, but they had no choice. It was the only way of surviving. And they lived in terror, because they didn't know. They had to wait for six months, 12 months, to see if they would make enough money by selling the wool in order to repay the landlord, not only the, origin, the principal of the loan, but also the interest, and to pay the wages and have something left over for them and their families. It was, you know, touch and go whether they would make it. So suddenly you have the ideology of profit maximization. Profit maximization was the equivalent of survival. That had never happened in the history of humanity before. The concept of profit maximization never existed. People wanted money. They wanted other things as well. They wanted kudos, status, uh, big armies, whatever. But the idea that you should live your life to maximize profit did not exist before the enclosures. Okay. So quick, quick that's question, the new, though. That's the brave new world we live in. Yes. But at that time, well, you could argue that for some of those peasants, profit maximize, the forced profit yeah. maximizing life that they found themselves in or forced into was way better than the feudal sort of slavery that they were, were born no, no, into. No, 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 there's pure starvation because they were out. There was no, they, if, they, if you gave them a choice between going back to feudalism and living like their grandparents did or being an entrepreneur, they would have cho chosen the former. They would have gone back to, to, to feudal. The, the choice was between dying of starvation in the slums of Manchester, yeah, with no jobs, because unfortunately yeah, the, the factory came 100 years afterwards, or 80 years afterwards, so they could not even sell themselves as laborers in the factory. The choice was between death and being entrepreneurs. <laughs> so you, you, you argue that there were no sort of happy entrepreneur, well, you know, 18th century entrepreneurs at that time, perhaps. Because that, well, defi because define, of, okay. define happiness. <laughs> well, part of, part of, the, part of the, the, the thing that I found interesting in the book is that you seem to suggest that this was the start of, um, uh, you know, the, this now galloping pace towards what we have right now. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Was there any other alternative? Like, could, could it not have happened that these things, the, the enclosures happened, the forced entrepreneurship happened, and, and then somehow we were able to kind of make that be actually not such a bad 
um, uh, sort of uh, evolution of that particular first first wave of capitalism. Um, you know that 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 the first wave of capitalism would have evolved into something more palatable than what we have now. Like, do you have? It's very any difficult to see or? that. Okay. It's very difficult to see that you had very um, violent, uh, authoritarian, feudal societies. It's very difficult to imagine how that kind of world would uh, generate a good society uh, as a result of enlightenment. It's very difficult. I wish maybe there was. I, look, I, I don't, I'm not a determinist. I don't be, I'm not saying that because history took that trajectory, there was no other trajectory it could have taken. Because if you look at other countries, for instance, if you look at France at the same time, it did, the, the, there was no industrial revolution in France. It didn't take place in that way. And it didn't take place in that way, if you, if you want me to speculate as to, yeah. as to why it didn't, because they did not have a powerful central king, central government. The London government of the king or, and the occasional queen uh, had um, effectively disarmed the barons as a result of sequ a sequence of civil wars. And the barons were militarily weak. The central London government was relatively strong. And the lords could not imagine that they could maintain their power by military means. Whereas in the France, the, um, the, the royal family was always weak. Huh? Always weak. And the, the, the original uh, fiefdoms were governed by lords that had maybe more power than the, the king of Paris. So the incentive to participate in these international trade routes in order to gather more power was simply absent in France. And also, in Britain, it was the king's army that helped evict the peasants. Yeah? Military yeah. might of the central government. The French government did not have that. So, if Britain was like France, the world would have been very different. I don't know how it would have... To. This is a beauty about human history. It is indeterminate. We have no idea. I mean, as, as we speak today, there are infinite trajectories that will take us to infinite alternative futures, and it depends on us which one we're going to be on. And that was the case back then as well. But it is quite interesting how we, you know, we ended up yeah. on the trajectory that brought us to where we are. Yeah. I think another plot point for me in the stories that you're telling, and I, I use the word stories actually in, a, in, a, in an affectionate manner, not, not to, to um, sort of use them in a way that somehow they're not true or they're fiction, but stories because this is the, the power of this book, is by telling these, these his stories, um, I, I, a lay person, can understand um, the kind of condition that I find myself in now. One of, the, one of the other stories that really spoke to me um, is actually, you know, uh, uh, ended up sort of uh, um, turning on a light for me. And my first sort of experience of banks really could be traced to my childhood as an immigrant, first generation immigrant coming to Toronto and watching It's a Wonderful Life for the first time, right? And so, uh, you know, I'm always, I always get teary-eyed when George is in his bank and they have a bank run and all his clients mm -hmm. come into the savings and loan and he goes, you know, don't take out $300, I'm gonna give you $5, you know, I can, I can give you guys that money. Yeah. And so when I read in your book um, that, you know, banks can just like uh, basically decide to magically, magic money for you, I honestly felt like saying, that's impossible. <laughs> like, how could that possibly be true? But that is, I think, a fallacy, as you say, that many people have. Yeah. Can you c explain that to us? Well, the most difficult thing to explain to young people and older people is the concept of money. Because it is so um, fickle as a concept, so malleable, so magical. It is completely intangible, and it is designed to be intangible. And we all, you know, many people, especially in North America, would love to make it tangible. You know, they have these um, fantasies of going back to the gold standard, to using something that is tangible and independent of the political system, Bitcoin, whatever. Uh, but what, so this is why I think it is very important to, 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 to raise this point that, that you just made. Um, let me just, okay, let, let, let me start by the title of, of, of the chapter in which I'm talking about banks and money. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm talking about, 
I'm referring to it as black magic. Now, most people have this concept in their heads that um, when you go to the bank and get a loan out, either to buy a car or to buy a house or to invest in your restaurant or whatever it is that you want to do with the money, that somehow the bank is like a vault. It's got money in there that other people have deposited, savers, and that the banker will give you some of those savings to do your thing, and the banker will make money as, as, as a result of the difference in the rate of interest that he charges you and that he pays the depositors. That is not what happens. Please, listen to me. <laughs> it is not what happens. The money is not there already deposited by somebody. Do you know where the money comes from? Nowhere. Thin air. It's black magic. But, you know, it's not really black magic. It's quite straightforward. Um, what happens is, like, okay, you go to the bank, they give you 100,000. At the end of the day, you go to the ATM, where, whereas you had zero, or let's say you had 5,000, you take the slip out of the ATM, it says 105,000. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> what happened was somebody typed a few zeros in your, in your account. The one zero 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 was just typed, added into your account. That money doesn't exist. It was conjured up like a sorcerer conjures up stuff. Mm. Um, ma ma Do you know how much of the money you have in your pockets as Canadians is produced by the Central Bank of Canada? What percentage? Three. Ninety-seven percent is produced out of thin air by commercial banks, just by typing those numbers. And the, 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 the hope of the banker is yeah, that um, you will do good things with the money that has been typed into account. So you, 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 know, you invest in your restaurant, let's say. Right? So what does this mean? It, mean, it means you, um, you spruce your restaurant up, you, buy, uh, you, you, know, you pay higher wages to attract a good chef, blah, 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 blah. So effectively what you do is you're sitting behind your own terminal and you are transferring some of those digits onto the bank accounts of other people. You know, of the chef, of the, of, of, of the interior decorator, of the person that supplies you the new, the new dishes. Yeah? That's, that's what happens. So the money simply f f it gets redistributed within a set of accounting books that are now digital, of course. They, don't, they are not even written on paper. Yeah? And the hope is, the banker's hope is, that you are going to make money out of this. Your restaurant is going to do well. You will repay the 100000 plus interest. So it is a little bit like, this is what I say in the book, yeah. it's a bit like the banker operating like a time traveler. He has a long arm and he pushes it through the timeline and snatches value from the future that has not been created yet, brings it into the present, gives it to you to produce the value that will repay the, the future. But if you do this, and every time you do this, you make money, why not do it much more quickly? <laughs> There's no reason why you shouldn't. You should do a lot more. That's what bankers do. Okay, and you end up with leverage ratios of 70 to 1. So for every dollar that they have, they have created 70. Okay, now, if they keep doing it, at some point they will have snatched so much value from the future to bring it to the present that the present can simply not regenerate it and repay the, the future. And at that point, when this incongruity takes place, some people who have borrowed money cannot repay the bank. If others who have put their money in the bank feel that the bank, my goodness, you know, maybe the bank cannot give us this money, they will go to the bank and they will ask for the money. This is, you know, the, 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 the scene that you are describing. Yeah, yeah. And because only 3% of the money is printed, okay, the, the bank is facing a bank run. The only thing that can stop the bank run is the central bank, in other words, the state, that says, don't worry, if the bank cannot repay you, I will. And that calms people's nerves. But immediately you realize that money is political. If it's not political, we have a capitalism that is going to fall flat on its face and not be able to get up again, as we, knew, well, as we experienced after 1929. It was only when the Federal Reserve played the, the role of lender of last resort. So money must always be political. Now, in Greek, the word, we have some Greeks here tonight. 
How many of you have a Greek affliction? <laughs> Commiserations. <laughs> and I'm a Greek economist, this is even worse. Uh, the Greek uh, uh, word for coin, the original currency, is nomisma. Nomisma. And it comes from the word nomos, okay? which means two things in ancient Greek. One is the law, and the other is to have faith, to believe. This is where the value of money comes from, from the law. So, your Canadian $20 note, do you know how much it costs to produce? Something like 12 cents. So why do you think it's got 20, its value is $20? Only because the law says that it is $20. And the state guarantees to accept that $20 bill as payment for taxes. So the law determines the value of money, one. And the second thing, nomizo, the ancient Greek verb to believe, the fact that you believe that it's worth 20, and that others believe that it's worth uh, 20, and you believe that there are others who believe that it, there are others who believe that it's worth 20. So money is, that's why I said it's fickle. Yeah. And any attempt to try to imagine that it exists like, you know, smartphones do. This is a tangible thing. You, you hold it. It's, it's got physical properties. It's, not, it's magic to me because I don't have no clue how it works. But to the, to the people who've created it, who've produced it, it's not magic at all. It's just pure science. It's like, you know, this. But money can never be this. It is a political con construct, a construct of community, a construct of a society that must be political. And if we do not control this, by definition, political force, because money is a force, it makes the world go around, as we know, um, even though it doesn't buy you, buy you love. Uh, <laughs> if this political force is not controlled democratically, then we don't live in a democracy. I think with that, Greg, are you telling me that we have time for questions? Yes, okay. I think with that, we do have time for questions. And um, we haven't said a word about Greece. Isn't that something? I know, I know. <laughs> Um, but while we're waiting for someone, so, so you know, great for you to, to have said that um, money is political. B before we get this question, can you just tell us, like, in, at the end of the book, in the epilogue, you tell your daughter, look, the biggest, the momentous, this, the biggest um, sort of battle you're going to have in your life is the momentous clash between these two kind of proposals. One is um, uh, democratize everything, and the other one is commodify everything. Mm -hmm. um, how do you propose we go about um, taking the steps to democratize money? A, a short preface. I find politics very difficult and very trying and particularly boring. <laughs> I would rather, you know, <laughs> sit in my home with my wife. Uh, my daughter will not want to be with us because she can't stand us. You know, she's an adolescent now. She, she needs her independence. And, and read poetry and read drama and write books. That's what I'd love to do. But we don't have this luxury. Not just my wife and me, but none of us. Because Capitalism is being undermined by, not the left, the left is useless, <laughs> by capitalism. <laughs> capitalism undermines itself. It produces a technologies that undermines itself. We are shifting gradually towards a matrix-like economy where we have produced all these machines and we end up being their slaves. And that includes the people who own them, who are constantly in fear of losing ownership of those machines, and in the end, you know, we, we all cry to, to ourselves to sleep at night. And the, the market for antidepressants does magnificently, uh, including and mainly for the 0.1 percent that are the oligarchy who deny the majority of their rights. So this is the stuff of genuine tragedy. It's like watching Macbeth. You know, Every crime that he commits makes him more desperate until in the end he wants to die. He wants you know, Macduff to stab him and says, lay on Macduff. And uh, you are damned if you, if you hold back and say enough, more or less. Um, <laughs> so democratizing our, our, our society is not an option. It is our duty to the next generation, to ourselves, because if we don't do that, then we will become slaves of our own artifacts, very much like Frankenstein became a victim of his own creation. 